My name is Dave Ripplinger, a bioenergy economic specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, this is uh, another monthly agricultural market situation outlook webinar hosted by uh, the uh, economic specialist at NDSU Extension. Uh, been doing this for quite a while. We're going to have a series of presentations uh, today and, and be happy to field questions at the end. Uh, we ask that you use the Q&A tool, although the, the chat tool does work as well. Um, but any anytime you have a question, feel free to, to share it with us and we'll make sure to get it before the end of the webinar. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Brian Parman, our egg finance specialist. Brian, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Dave. I'm gonna get my screen share going. Okay. All right, so uh, today's talk, I could have went a lot of different ways. I gotta move this over here. Uh, but um, I think the biggest thing dominating the headlines right now has been uh, the inflation numbers that we've all seen in the news um, being, you know, historically high, the highest in the last uh, 40 years. And so I put the anyone who's had an economics class remembers the old Phillips curve. So I put that on my my lead slide where it shows uh, the relationship between high inflation and low unemployment and low inflation and high unemployment and inflationary expectations. But we're not going to cover that. Uh, these are some headlines I grabbed in the last few days uh, that re relate to inflation. Again, dominating headlines as stocks have been crumbling as folks fear inflation is going to continue to accelerate uh, ex inflationary expectations in the public uh, growing higher and higher. And I pulled these from a variety of sources. Inflation hits a fresh 40 year high, higher unemployment rate looms as the Fed fights inflation. That goes back to that Phillips curve where they raise rates and people stop investing and growing and borrowing money. Um, and uh, it, it hurts uh, employment. And then the Fed may have to do something it hasn't done since 1994. And it did it, uh, which was a three quarter point, uh, 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent uh, rate hike uh, at the last meeting. So this was the inflation number that came out in May, and this was a lot higher than uh, folks expected. Uh, you know, ex experts, so to speak, and people who track this at the Federal Reserve and other other entities do as well, was 8.6 percent for the year from May of last year through May of this year. And uh, the big big uh, driver in all items, obviously, is energy. Uh, you know that that inflation uh, that those prices in general are up 35 percent. Foods up 10 percent since la a year ago. And then what they call core inflation, which is all items uh, except for food or energy, uh, that inflation rate is right around six percent. So a little bit lower. And the reason they call that uh, core inflation, let me back up here. And it's not that food and energy doesn't matter. They're huge parts of the budget. It's just that those items can be so volatile that if you're looking at inflation of most other everyday items, uh, they can they can move up and down. And in fact, these are one of the some of the items that actually will uh, decline in in price where maybe some of the other durable goods, new cars, things like that might not. So this just shows a, a graph uh, since about 19 late 1950s on inflation rates year over year. And we can see in this area in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, those are the record for inflation for as long as the data has been being kept and uh, approaching it at some points near 13%. And the green line there with the dot is where about 8.6% sits. So you can see it's not the highest that we've ever had recorded, but you know you gotta go back a long time, like I said, 40 years to, to find a, a comparable uh, period where inflation was uh, around that same, same uh, level. Um, and and it would have to go quite a bit higher to, to reach a new record, but we, we obviously hope that that doesn't happen. But the environment, we, inflationary environment we've been operating in for the last 40 years has been relatively low with the early 90s and the last 20 years really hovering around that, that two to two and a half percent mark that the, that the Federal Reserve is actually targeting. So I just put this table together here real quick and uh, uh, I got it actually, I got it from the BLS, but then kind of modified it so it fit on a slide some and then highlighted yellow. Uh, the areas where uh, in the last 12 months inflation has been high, uh, food at home, about 12%, uh, gasoline, a big one there, 48%, so increased almost almost 50% higher, fuel oil in general, up over 100% higher, uh, natural gas up 30% over the uh, the 
over the year. New vehicles almost up 13% and used vehicles uh, percentage-wise are up, up even more. And a lot of that has to do with uh, demand and some of the inability to get parts for new vehicles. And so uh, used vehicles being a, being a hot ticket item. But again, all energy, um, really, really, really high inflation for, for most energy products and, and food as well, but not nearly as high as energy. So I, I made these, these charts, these are basically expectations from the market on what the federal funds rate will be. And in a minute, I'll talk about why that's even important, uh, just real quick to refresh everyone's uh, uh, knowledge of it. But when I was looking at these charts uh, a month or even a few days ago, they were very different. So the, the, the June meetings already happened, they increased at a quarter of a point. And basically what this says is, what, what, do the, what does the market think the Federal Reserve is going to do in July? And about 74% uh, say uh, they're gonna do another approximately, uh, maybe, maybe even a, a closer to a, a one, point, uh, one point hike uh, around that um, amount for, for July coming out of the year. And then the target rate for 14 December. So this is the last time they meet before the end of this year, 2022 is in uh, the mid middle of December. And the market is thinking for the most part, if you add these two numbers together, so 40% plus 28 and a half, you get about 60, uh, uh, almost, almost 70%, 69%. Think that the federal funds rate gonna be between 350 basis points and 450 basis points. So you take a midpoint at that and you say about 4% on the federal funds rate. Okay, so from where it is now at, uh, at, at, at the current uh, uh, rate being about 150, 1.75, that would be close to a two and a quarter, two and a half percent increase in the federal funds rate between now and the end of the year. Now this can change dramatically depending on if the inflation numbers come out for June being as high as May or, or even higher, then, th then this will all shift and you know, the expectations will be for an even higher rate at the end of the year. So that's how these kind of can move. These aren't set in stone. It just depends on as more information is gained, uh, the, the, uh, the projections change. So here is a couple of charts from the Federal Reserve. This is the 10-year timeline for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And I have, a, I have a table that shows them as of this morning, but you know, approaching five and a half percent uh, on, on average nationwide, even, even more in, in many cases, this is a little bit behind. I show you some current numbers because this doesn't include the re recent actions that have been taken. And the weekly average since 1971 for the 30 year rate is 7.77%. Okay. So where it is right now is still quite a bit below, but you'll notice the higher rates, the 10%, 8%, 9%, most of that happened uh, since 1971 uh, through about the early 1990s. Since the early 1990s, uh, it's it hovered around that average. That's that's if you want to find a period when they when they were around there is that mid 90s, early 2000s. But then after that, they started dropping, dropping, and have steadily stayed low, much lower than the average over the last 20 years ish or so. Uh, but then have started moving back upwards. So here's a chart showing the 30-year mortgage rate versus the 10-year T bond rate versus the federal funds rate with the 30 year mortgage being blue, federal funds rate being red, and then the T bond rate, the 10 year treasury note being green. And you can see they move together, uh, especially the uh, 10 year T bond and the 30 year mortgage rate move very closely together, the green and blue lines, with the 30 year mortgage rate being a couple of, typically about 2% higher than the, than the federal, than the, than the T bond rate, the mortgage rate being a couple of percent higher. The relationship between the federal funds rate though and these interest rates uh, is not so clear cut. Okay, you can see they tend to trend together, but an increase of a couple of percentage points in the federal funds rate does not necessarily mean a couple of percentage point increase in the T-bond rate and thus the 30-year mortgage rate. So here was the rates that I pulled this morning. 30-year uh, fixed rates about 5.91%, 15-year rate 5.11. So we're approaching 6% already on 30 year fixed rates. Uh, you look and it's about five and a half to 6% uh, where they're sitting right now. And they may slide upward a little bit uh, given what's, what's transpired here recently. What's challenging though is actually projecting how the, the Fed's actions and the federal funds rate is going to 
six months, eight months down the road, uh, impact interest rates going forward. And, and a big reason for that is some of these relate, there's a lot of things that happen that uh, in the market and expectations of consumers and things going on in the macro economy that make that relationship a little bit murkier than just saying, well, we're going to increase the federal funds rate and the, and the consumer lending rate goes up too. So there was a research article that came out a while back in 2005, basically looking at these relationships between the 10 year uh, uh, treasury and the uh, federal funds rate. And what they basically found was that a 100 basis point or 1% increase in the federal funds rate explains about a 37 basis point or 0.37% change or increase in the uh, uh, treasury, the, the 10 year T bond rate. So currently the 1.75% federal funds rate, this would imply about a 4.15 uh, to 5% 10 year bond rate, okay? And that's what the, this is what I'm saying here is that if that projection is true, if three and a half to four and a half percent federal funds rate is indeed what happens at the end of the year, it would imply about a five percent, four to five percent 10 year T bond rate, which would imply about a 6.15 to a 7 percent 30 year mortgage rate at the end of the year. If those relationships kind of hold to this 37 basis point rule. So where would we, what would we have to look to to find that? And that would be right around oh, 2006, 2007. That's the last time rates were about seven, seven and three quarters percent, 7.77 percent. Uh, so if you want to look at a comp for what uh, the environment looked like at 7 percent interest, that's that's about the last time they were that high, the the 30 year mortgage rates. But I say all that to show this. The relationship between the federal funds rate and the 30 year rate and the 10 year T bond, it, it can in an, in, in an inflationary environment that we exist in now, you can see here with that red line being the federal funds rate, there are periods with with high inf during high inflation that we see the federal funds rate actually higher than the 30 year fixed mortgage rate and higher than the 10 year treasury securities, um, especially this mid to late 70s and then this late 70s early 80s period the federal funds rate was actually higher than that and and again it goes to that there are a lot of things um, that transpire expectations and you think about it in an inflationary environment maybe folks are especially if items like food and energy uh, items that are somewhat most somewhat inelastic where people don't really have that much of a choice on how much of it they buy, maybe what they consume, maybe they take a trip or two less, but still got to get to work, still got to put food on the table. And if those items are, are increasing, you can increase the federal funds rate to hopefully hike interest rates, but a high inflationary environment on inelastic items may curb spending on things like durable goods that you would have ordinarily financed. What does the interest rate do? Well, it's a, a way to essentially ration loans and loanable funds. If folks aren't borrowing a lot, buying new homes, buying new cars, because inflation is hitting them elsewhere, so they're putting off those big ticket purchases, well, then you can hike the federal funds rate, but if loans aren't being made, then there, then there isn't much need for an even higher interest rate to allocate the loanable funds, if you will. It's kind of a supply and demand thing. If demand for loanable funds is low because of folks lower than it might otherwise have been because folks are worried about rising prices in, in uh, things that they consume like food and energy, they put off those purchases, demand for loanable funds is lower, so the supply, you know, is easily able to accommodate it at a lower rate than otherwise would have been. So that's why these relationships break down a little bit and you see these periods where these federal funds rate rates uh, uh, hike up pretty fast above that. But nonetheless, the relationship over the long term has been that 0 .3, 37 basis points uh, on the federal funds rate against the T-bond rate and then about 2% between the T-bond rate and the 30-year uh, uh, mortgage rate. So going back, it's the best projection um, that we, uh, I can come up with essentially uh, based on the relationships that have been established historically between these three different uh, benchmarks. So we went through a lot there. Uh, as I said, uh, more information comes down uh, th these things will more than likely change, but where we sit right now, 
I think the folks that were thinking that rates, because I was reading some articles from back in March and April where folks thought rates were going to top out at 5% or 5.5%. Um, well, we're already north of 5.5%, closer to 6 uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we push it to 7 7.5% on your, on your 30-year mortgage kind of rates. But again, as the Fed hikes the federal funds rate, that relationship isn't perfect. And so it may be the case where the spread, the gap between the the ten year T bond, the federal funds rate, and then thirty year actually gets gets more narrow. Okay. So I believe Dr. Olson has logged on and is going to be able to um, present and share his screen. He came flying in from Bismarck, sat down, slammed his computer in, and he think he might be ready to roll. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so good good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Brian said, I did kind of blow in from Bismarck today. Uh, fortunately, I had a tailwind this time. I had a headwind going in last night. But uh, here's my contact information. So if there's something you think about later on uh, or have questions or follow up things, please be sure to, to contact me and I'd be happy to do uh, the best I can to answer those questions. All right. Uh, so first, a quick review of the WASI report. Again, last Friday, we had uh, the, an update, a monthly update for the world agricultural supply demand estimates. And again, that it focuses not only on domestic production and consumption, but also looks at some international information. I'm just going to provide a really quick summary of uh, some, some of the minor changes that occurred this month uh, between May and June. Um, let's start with old crop ending stocks. So this would be for the crop that's currently still in the bin. Um, Again, June 1 is the beginning of the new marketing year for wheat. Uh, we won't have an official closeout, you know, officially closing out the, the year end until we get some information on inventories uh, in the June 30 report. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So what I'd like you to look at uh, for old crop numbers, uh, are two things. First, the blue line on the very top, um, this is the, the average of the industry estimates before the re report was released. So these are the numbers that the traders were expecting to see. The blue black line is highlighted is the average or is the numbers we reported last month. And of course the red on the very bottom is the information that we got last Friday. So two ways of thinking about this, I guess the way I prefer to have people think about it is how did to the numbers we got on Friday compare to what the industry was expecting to see? Because that's usually causes the, the, the shock or the adjustment in the system. As you can tell, uh, again, the blue versus the red uh, numbers were very, very close to what was the trade was expecting. Again, we're getting we're basically at the end of the marketing year for wheat. We're getting very close to the end of the marketing year, which, again, begins on September 1 for corn and soybeans. So, you know, unless there's something drastic that occurs, there isn't going to be a lot of shock value in the old crop numbers. Now. Before I move on, I do want to say the really the only substantial changes that we saw between the May report and now this June report was some small adjustments in export forecast for the old crop marketing year. So if you notice the numbers that we had last month versus the numbers we got this month for corn, uh, USDA did reduce their forecast for total corn exports a little bit, which then ended up increasing exports of the final ending stocks number or the amount that we're gonna have in, in inventory just before the next marketing year. The reverse happened in soybeans. So uh, USDA increased, um, I guess in a minor way, my opinion, I uh, increased the forecast for total soybean exports for this old crop marketing year which then again, reduce the amount of inventory that we have. So really those are the only two substantial changes. Again, a reduction in, in exports, uh, export forecast for corn, a slight increase in export forecast for soybeans. Well, because these inventory values from the old crop changed, that becomes part of the input for our new crop numbers. So this is the same information, but this would be for the crop that, um, is just now being finished planting. So we're looking now a year into the future for both production and consumption. Um, most of the numbers that are in these, uh, the bottom um, red numbers are, are mathematical forecasts, they're projections of what we expect to happen for both production and consumption. So again, 
the information from last month gets carried for or last year's numbers gets carried forward into this year's numbers. So really the only adjustments we saw in ending stocks from last month to this month, or even what the trade is expecting to see relative to the numbers we actually got were contained in the old crop numbers. There really was no um, significant changes or adjustments made between the May and the June um, um, uh, reports for both old, for new crop in particular. I wanna be very specific for the new crop numbers the crop that just got planted, which is this table, uh, essentially no changes from last month's forecast. Um, the other thing we did get last Friday was an update in forecast of our projected yields, i.e. total production for winter wheat. Okay, so if we look at all wheat projections, which would include the spring wheat in Durham's, um, those numbers reflect now what we saw in the winter wheat forecast. So winter wheat uh, is divided looking at all winter wheat as well as by subclass. So hard red winter wheat, soft red winter wheat, and then white winter wheat. Now the white wheat includes both soft white as well as hard white. The moral of the story, the big takeaway was let's look at the, uh, the changes in, in the wheat, winter wheat by class. And I guess this helps tell the story. When you look at what USDA was projecting last month versus the current month forecast, they did have a slight reduction in essentially yield projections for hard red winter wheat. Um, they had very, very similar for soft red winter wheat. So the hard red winter wheat would be like Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. And of course, they're having some very dry conditions, especially in Western, uh, Western parts of the, each of those states. The soft red wheat is primarily produced in Missouri, Southern Illinois, um, some into Indiana and, and Wisconsin. Um, those yields were basically left unchanged, but there was a slight increase in the winter, the white wheat production. White wheat is a bit of the white wheat is in, in Michigan, but they also the primary growing region is in the Pacific Northwest. So they had a slight increase in um, yields and, and therefore production estimates coming for white wheat. So all of these adjustments then are built into or, or revised into this all wheat yield production. Okay, now. Before I transition into forward looking and some, some updates on what, kind of what's going on with Ukraine and Ukraine grain, grain movements, I do want to remind everybody on June 30th, so in a couple of weeks, we're going to get two important reports. Uh, one important report will be a, the grain, grain stocks report. Um, so again, that's where USDA takes a survey of farmers as well as contacts all of the major commercial uh, purchases of grain and say, how much grain do you have on inventory for the, at this particular date? Well, it's reported on June 30, but the, the grain stocks is for June 1. So that June 1 inventory number will be important because that will be the final ending stocks for last year's wheat. So that'll be the end of the, of the wheat marketing year. We'll transition from one marketing year to the next. So those, those um, ending stocks numbers for wheat will be calculated and, and compiled in this June 30 grain stocks report. The other thing that we're gonna get at the end of June will be an update of the survey of planted acres and it's called the acreage report. So if you guys remember in, um, in March, we had the planting and plant, perspective plantings report. We changed the name a few years ago. So the perspective planting report was a survey of farmers in March to say, what were you intending to plant? And now this June acreage report is going to be a survey of farmers asking them, what did you actually get seeded? Now, historically, at least in North Dakota, when we've had very high levels of prevent plant, we do get a survey number for North Dakota for June, but oftentimes they'll try and resurvey again in July just to make sure that they picked up all of the possible changes. And, and I, I do kind of expect to see that happening. Uh, but again, the market will respond to the information that we have in that June report. So the surveys of farmers are going out right now for the next couple of weeks. They're going to be collecting data, both by mail-in survey as well as phone survey, and asking farmers, what did you actually see? What blend of crops did you actually plant uh, in 2022? So again, everybody will be watching for those numbers on June 30th. So let me now transition a little bit, give a brief update. Uh, there's been more recently in the last several days, some discussions about not only harvest, winter wheat harvest beginning in Ukraine, as well as Southern Russia, 
That's coming up now in you know, very shortly. But also some concerns about Ukraine's ability to be able to ship grain, to be able to not only get the bins cleaned out from, from last year's crop, being able to get pushed that through the system so they have storage capacity, but then also are they going to be able to uh, be able to store and sell the crop that's either being planted this year and or that's going to be harvested now in a few weeks in the case of winter wheat. So I wanted to give just a brief update. Um, this is some information on, on the current status of the Russian occupation. Okay, this is since the war has begun, what has happened with the area within Ukraine that's currently controlled by Russian forces. So the red area is are those areas where the, the Russian have control of that land mass. They, in, at least for this particular source, the Institute of Study of War, uh, they update this on a regular basis. So this is information as of June 14th. The black area was the areas of Ukraine that were claimed by Russia before this uh, uh, military action began. So those black areas were already claimed by Russia. The red areas are the new areas that have been taken over since the war has begun. So just ge geographically, I want everybody to kind of get reoriented on where we're at. So here's the Black Sea. Um, Ukraine is obviously in the middle of this. On the right-hand side would be Southern Russia. Um, you can see to the north is Belarus. Uh, to the northwest would be Poland. Um, to the south and in southeast, southwest, excuse me, you have Moldova and Romania. And I'm gonna talk about those in just a moment. So here's the Black Sea. This is the major shipping route for grain, uh, wheat, as well as corn and, and, and barley and, and sunflower oil, which are major exports uh, into the what we call the Black Sea region. Just as a reminder, all of the ships or vessels, whether they be calling, calling grain or petroleum products like na liquefied natural gas or crude oil, in order to exit the Black Sea and get into the Mediterranean, it needs to go through this, this, uh, the peninsula of Istanbul, or there's a canal, uh, basically a river that is, is used as the portage between the Black Sea region and the Mediterranean. So that's really the choke point for a lot of the, of the, of the movement of product. Um, now, transit through the, that canal of, or the, 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 that Strait of Istanbul is, is right now fairly fluid. The challenge we're having is being able to get ships and vessels loaded and into out of the ports, number one, but then also the cost of the vessels. One of the issues that ocean freight has now gone up significantly for any kind of vessel entering or exiting the Black Sea. So if you're a private vessel owner or ship owner, whether you're hauling grain or bulk products or whether you're hauling petroleum products, everybody knows that that's a war zone. The insurance on those vessels have gone up tremendously. And I know I've talked about that in previous, uh, previous re recordings or previous sessions. So I don't wanna you know, go through too much of the details, but just recognize that right now there is a flow of grain going back and forth, but it's greatly reduced from where it was before. So now that we have this orientation, let's zoom in a little bit and focus specifically on Ukraine. So the first issue, the vast majority historically of, of grain movements out of Ukraine has been by ocean vessel. Almost all of the exports from Ukraine have been loaded onto an ocean vessel and then shipped through uh, the Black Sea region. So I wanna give just again, geog geographically, a, a recap of where are some of the major ports? Where are some of the major ports in particular that handle grain and grain movements? So the ones that you probably have heard or seen on the news, uh, one of them is Mariupol, which is over here. It's currently controlled by uh, the Russians. That, of course, was one of those areas that had been heavily bombarded. There's been a lot of devastation of the city itself. A lot of the grain handling facilities as well as the port facilities have been damaged. So just for orientation, here's Mariupol. Um, my cola is another major port, again, primarily for grain and grain shipments. Uh, this has been under attack recently. There has been some damage to some of the grain elevation systems in that port. Uh, it's obviously also been mined. And so this is one of those areas where there's basically no grain and or any kind of shipment of product out of that port. Now, Odessa is one of the key ports for uh, Ukraine, not only because it is a high volume port, but it's also one that is just far enough out of the zone of the current military action 
that the question is, can that be used? Well, the, the port facilities right around Odessa has been mined. And so one of the issues now is, of course, if you have mines in, in the Bay Area, how do you get vessels in and out? And I'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Now, short term, the Russia, the excuse me, Ukrainians have been trying to ship some of their product uh, through Moldova into Romania. Um, Constantina is the port that they're using. Now, the, the grain loading facilities in Constantina is, are not as large. They don't have the high volume loading capacity that they would have, let's say, in an Odessa or in a Mariupol. So there is some grain shipments going out of that, but the volumes are greatly reduced simply because of the size of the port facilities. The ones that I have identified in red are Russian uh, port facilities, Rostov, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce this because I'll, I'll mispronounce it and I don't want to insult anybody. But these, these are the two of the major grain loading facilities or ports uh, that are part of Russia. Um, those are still open. Uh, the Russians have been able to get some, in particular out of the southern one, get some grain moved out of that. But again, because of the cost of the vessels, uh, the volume shipped are down dramatically from what they have been before the war began. Now for grain movement, the other thing that the Ukrainians have been trying to do is move grain by rail, um, especially into Western Europe. Now I've talked about this before a little bit, just as a reminder, the biggest challenge we're facing or the biggest complication that's being faced is that the gauge of the rail, the width of the, of the tracks is wider in the former Soviet Union states like Ukraine and Belarus than it is in Poland. So the, the width of the track in Poland is the same as most of Western Europe, which is also the same as what we use here in the United States. So the fact that the trains run on a different gauge means that once the grain hits the border of Poland, it has to be offloaded from one train and reloaded onto another train to be able to get into, into um, Western Europe. The other thing more recently now they're trying to negotiate and get higher volumes of grain shipments is actually moving by train from Ukraine into Lithuania or Latvia. And, and Latvia with this uh, port of Riga is, is actually one of the major ports that does have a fairly good facilities for loading grain as well as the one in Lithuania. And of course the, the rail of the gauge, the gauge of the railroads is the same from Ukraine all the way through Belarus to Latvia and Lithuania. The challenge, of course, is that Belarus is a sister state to Russia. And so there's a very strong political connection between Belarus and Russia. And so there's they have to pass through Belarus, which again has been politically very challenging. Um, my understanding is there have been a couple of rail shipments that have moved that direction, but again, volumes are fairly light. So what does all this mean? It means the Ukraine is still going to have some challenges. They're doing their best to try and be able to move product through the system. Uh, but there are these hurdles. Now, one of the other th comments I want to make is don't ever underestimate people's creativity. So given some time and, of course, some financial resources, there are ways that these grain flows can be rerouted and become more efficient. Now, more recently, in the last couple of days, uh, you may have heard that the United Nations has been working very hard to negotiate some kind of agreement between Ukraine um, and Russia and, and possibly uh, uh, Turkey and, and or Belarus to be able to encourage higher volumes of shipping, not only with Ukrainian grain, but also with Russian grain. And the challenge, of course, is the concerns about humanitarian efforts, about high, uh, high um Food prices, uh, in particular, in some of those developing countries or some of the countries that typically buy a lot of the product from like wheat and corn from Ukraine or Russia. There's, there's really concerns about some of the, the, the um, food issues and food concerns uh, in some of those countries. So United Nations has got involved. Uh, Turkey is trying to take some leadership in, in trying to be the go-between, kind of that negotiating um, point between Russia and Ukraine to see if they can get something out. One of the plans right now, the most recent that we heard as of yesterday, was a plan to create some what they call sea corridors or some kind of safe routes from some of the ports to be able to get Ukrainian grain loaded onto ocean vessels uh, through the Black Sea and then onto uh, other destinations. Now, before the idea was, well, we got to clear the mines before you're going to allow these vessels in and out. 
the current plan or current negotiation is saying, well, can we bring these, can, these commercial ships in and out that are guided through different, through specific um, regions that are guided by Ukrainian research and rescue vis- vessels. So they're able to detect and they're in pretty much most of the mines are known where they're at right now. So the idea is, can we find a path or a route through these minefields where we don't have to remove the mines, but they all, will allow safe patch passage to be able to load it and then uh, transit and being unloaded. Now, we don't know the exact status of this. That's the current plan. We haven't had any confirmation that this has actually been signed on to or that there's going to be additional product flows. And again, once the, the other issue that I have to specific, specifically would be, well, are, what about the cost of moving those vessels? Again, obviously, if I owned an ocean vessel, I don't know if I'd be really thrilled to send my property into the middle of a war zone. So there's still going to be some problems and challenges there. Um, the plan B for Ukraine, and this is now being also discussed, uh, before the war began, at least based on current reports, Ukraine had about 75 million metric tons of domestic grain storage. So that was about the capacity they had to be able to store the grain and then from harvest and then be able to meter it and export it or use it domestically. Well, because of the war efforts, because of either uh, regions being taken over by the Russian military and or the destruction or damage due to some of the storage, right now the estimate is uh, Ukraine can only access about 60 million metric ton of the 75 million metric ton storage capacity. Again, there was a report that went, came out a couple of weeks ago that said that there's still about 20 million metric ton of green in storage in Ukraine right now um, that still needs to be shipped. Again, because of the, of the volumes that were produced last year and the inability to be able to ship it, these, some of the bins are still full. So it, we're still kind of figuring out how much capacity is already in place that can be utilized uh, uh, and, and how much is available. So to backfill that, to try and say, well, how can we compensate or adjust? There is a plan that's being developed right now to try and construct some temporary grain storage, either module structures that can handle uh, temporary grain storage and or plastic bags. Now up here in the Northern Plains, we've used both of those kinds of structures before when we had very large crops as, as most of you know, that they are intended for temporary storage. They're not really intended for any kind of long storm, long-term storage capacity, but it does give you that flexibility to be able to add some, some surge capacity within your system. Now, the United States uh, has already pledged that they will help contribute and build some of these temporary storage, primarily on, on the borders. Again, the United States is being very careful not to get directly involved in Ukrainian activities, but they did say along the border areas that they would construct these temporary storage and help uh, help uh, support that effort. The European Union, as as is under negotiations right now, they say have they are currently considering providing some kind of similar type of products, but they have not formally committed to that. So again, a lot of uncertainty yet about not only how many acres are going to be planted. Uh, how much are going to be harvested, what the yield potential is going to be, but then also from a product flow standpoint, how do we manage these inventories going forward? Um, So with that, I will close off my presentation um, and stop, and I will transition and let Dr. or Mr. Tim Petrie take over. Um, And again, I'll be available for questions at the end. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie here again and give you a little update on the livestock market. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, weather, and uh, the new drought monitor came out this morning, is in the upper left, and we kind of set a milestone there for the first time in over two years, actually back to March 17, 2020. Uh, no portion of North Dakota has any uh, color there on the drought monitor, it means we're uh, drought free for in over two years, so quite a milestone. Uh, go down below that is then one year ago. Uh, how uh, bad we were in North Dakota. But uh, for the cattle industry in particular, looking at those two charts, we've kind of flip-flopped. And you see the Southern Plains a year ago, Texas was a big cow-calf state, Oklahoma, Kansas, their uh, top three, four, uh, you know, throw in Missouri uh, states with cows. They were pretty much drought-free last year, and now drought has settled in there, but it's left up here. 
So uh, just kind of a, a switcheroo there. So go to the left-hand side and more on what I'm gonna talk about today then, the USDA again, when the drought monitor comes out, they look at how many uh, cows are in the different states and the dark green, this is on the right-hand side, there are major cow-calf areas and the red dash lines are the drought overlaid on that. We still have about half the beef cow inventory is an area of drought. Uh, not a lot different than what it was last year. It's just we flipped around. So there's still a lot of cattle and drought and that has ramifications. So I'll go to beef cow slaughter now. This has been talked a lot about in the industry here as we've progressed to this year in particular lately is that beef cow slaughter is just soaring. Last year, of course, due to the drought. And then also, you know, we had lower than expected and volatile calf prices and and uh, as well as drought, uh, we were 9% higher than the 2016 to 20 average last year in beef cow slaughter, which we said was relatively high. And depending on drought, thought, it would, you know, if, we, if the drought continued, we would do that again. And we are just kind of blowing that out of the water. We're up 15% over last year's 9% higher uh, uh, cow slaughter this year. So that is a lot of ramifications for the cow herd and what the cow herd will be. Our, our first indication of, uh, of, of how many uh, beef cows we will have and, uh, and looking into the future will be uh, on uh, July 22nd, uh, NAS will release their, their uh, numbers. They don't do it on a state by state basis only for US, but it's a semi-annual inventory report. That'll come out July 22nd as of July 1st. So that'll give us an indication. But again, we're a lot of times, and I'll show you in a minute the, the January 1st numbers, but that's very significant. If that, we don't know what's going to happen. Right now you see, look at the, when the beef cow slaughter is usually high there, to, it moves up in October and particular high in November and December when we're pregnancy checking the cows and so on and, and getting rid of the, the calls. We are last couple, several weeks, two, three weeks, we've been above those fall levels. And so uh, the, the, the question is not, is the beef cow herd going to be lower next, uh, you know, af after the end of this year by next January 1st? Is, the question is, isn't it's going to be how much is lower? And then again, is how much longer in months or even years is the drought going to continue and the cow herd going to go down? Because taking the cow herd down, certainly uh, that's a positive for, for prices into the future. So here's the January 1st cow numbers. And, uh, you know, on, on a cyclical basis, I like to go, you know, for our talking now because of the drought and particularly the drought in the Southern Plains, I like to go back on the bottom of the chart, you see 2006 and go up there is, is the start of the previous liquidation phase that was a long one. A typical liquidation phase as it takes about four years to liquidate enough cows if, if, if prices are low enough and to get back where prices are high enough to increase the herd. So until 2006, there through 2009, we had our normal four-year liquidation and started January 1st, 2010 at 31.4 million head. That should have been the end of that liquidation phase and we should have leveled out. But what happened then is we had uh, four years of continued very severe drought in the Southern Plains like they're experiencing now. So uh, we took uh, cat, beef cow numbers down and another 2.4 million head, uh, low numbers, 29 million head there to start January 1st, 2014. That's why we had the previous record high cattle prices in 2014, or at least one of the reasons. But then when it rained in the Southern Plains, then we had a rapid buildup. So now looking at what's happened in this cattle cycle, we've had uh, three years then of liquidation for a variety of reasons. Again, uh, drought has been a big part of that, but also the lower and volatile calf prices in our black swan events and so on. So the question mark, now, you know, if we continue beef cow slaughter on the pace that it is now, and if we continue that throughout the year, we may not, and it may rain down there, and maybe we're getting rid of the cows earlier that would have came in the fall, and our fall numbers will be lower. Those are all question marks we, we don't know, but we could take the cow herd down significantly if that beef cow uh, slaughter continues, and the drought worsens. Again, we're out of 
out of drought right now in North Dakota, but we're only a couple hot, windy days, always in North Dakota from being back in drought. And look what's predicted for this weekend, 100 degree temperatures and so on. So a lot of things can happen. But we're going to take the beef cow herd down again this year for sure. And probably more so than we did last year, the way it looks now. And so that is supportive for prices into the into the future. So, you know, on the kind of you would think with all those cows we're selling, that would really, really pressure the cow market, but it hasn't done so. In fact, cow prices are uh, higher than $13 the last week, higher than they were the pr previous two years, or, or well, um, not including 2020, that was still affected by COVID. And so we're higher in prices for a very good reason. And Brian talked about this, and that is because of the high inflation and and so on, and high gas prices and all that. Consumers are, are, uh, are bidding down on what they buy. And so hamburger is a hot item, as well as chicken and some other things, and uh, to the detriment of steaks and so on. And so uh, because of that, uh, cows are in really, really good demand. Another thing I just wanna mention here is, this series I use for the Northern Plains average, these are for those 85 to 90% lean cows that are really broken mouth cows that had a, a calf on them and so on and, and are, are very thin. And so they're really at the low for the market, but that's the series I have. So, you know, a lot of cows are selling up in the eighties. Now I just pulled a market report uh, there to, uh, on, the, on the right hand side showing, you know, cows selling all the way up to 90. I just watched them market a little bit this morning selling cows and cows up in the nineties there, but a lot of them in the eighties. So I'm on the low end now, but the, 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 the idea is, you know, higher quality, uh, animals bring more. And so they're all about 10 to $15 higher. It's just the series I'm showing you there. We're up at 75 when we we're down at 62 or so a, a year ago. So cows are uh, still selling very well in, in spite of the amount that we're, we're selling. Go to the fed cattle then again. And uh, fed cattle, of course, are very important for feeder cattle prices. And fed cattle kind of stalled out at about $1.40 for most of the year here. However, again, uh, $20 higher than last year. Again, with the lower calf crops, beef production is down. And uh, in spite of inflation and all the other things, uh, cattle prices all are higher and they don't seem, maybe don't seem like that. The red squares there are the futures market. And uh, you, usually we do have midsummer weakness with the high uh, previous calf crop being slaughtered and then uh, increase and by the end of the year as slaughter drops off and demand picks up for the the, the uh, cuts as well and so futures market is still saying there that we're going to be up to 148 by the end of the year on fed cattle and again uh, you know uh, uh, what's going to happen to inflation in the, the stock market the stock market going down is certainly not good for selling stakes and so on and 401 keys declining and then you know with the continuing lower calf crop the futures are up there over 150 for most of uh, next uh, year up to 155 there in april on the futures and i'm in agreement with that now but you know the economy is the big question uh, but from a supply standpoint, again, we're going to be better and better off for the next several years because of that lower color. So go to the uh, lighter weight calf prices again. They're up $25 uh, from where they were uh, last year. None really selling in North Dakota. Now our USDA is, you know, not, not many to even report now until we get to September and, and uh, whatever. But uh, you know, I think we're still going to have that seasonal weakness into the fall. That purple arrow there shows the last uh, three years, and we could even add uh, 2018, the last four years, they've really bottomed out there in the middle of October, a really tough time to sell calves because that's when they all start hitting the market. Most of them aren't weaned yet and maybe a snowstorm and so on. So, you know, I think that's a, a target to somewhat try to avoid if we can. And, and so uh, likely they will be lower in the fall than they are now. I'm kind of targeting 190 as just an average price. Again, there's a wide range of 30 to 
$35 range from the lowest quality to the higher quality, like I mentioned in cows, but using 190 as an average, but probably could be lower than that in, in mid-October and then pick up. But we should still should be the way it looks now, uh, better than the last uh, several years on calves, because we're going to have, again, uh, now the really the third straight lower uh, calf crop to sell. A big question mark is corn. And, you know, corn is at high levels now. And, and uh, Frayne talked about some of the fundamentals there in corn. So if all of a sudden to get drought in the corn belt or something else would cause the corn to spike even more. Remember that, you know, change uh, calf, uh, change corn, 10 cents a bushel, change calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. So that's probably the biggest un, unknown now. And then again, we're going to have to have those uh, fed cattle up there to 148 to kind of to, uh, to uh, help prices there by fall as well. Go to the heavyweight yearling uh, cattle then, they aren't up as much as calves because they're affected more by the high corn prices, but you know they still have throughout the year been better than the last uh, several years, still up about $20 over last year, trading right on the average about 160 here the last uh, several weeks. Uh, compared to more down by, you know, 140 a year ago and so on. And the futures market is still optimistic with fewer to sell and getting cattle, fed cattle up to 148 and, and barring, you know, uh, more tragic news in the economy, I suppose, you know, you're seeing those red bars there on the, on the futures uh, getting, you know, up there to almost 178 on the futures yesterday there for November uh, significantly higher than they were last year. And uh, again, corn is a big player here. And that's, you know, you know, keeping corn at what the decent corn futures are now and not seeing an expansion in them. And then again, next year, even a better year with those gold squares, the 2023 uh, futures there on the left-hand side of the chart based a lot of, again, on that uh, the lower calf crop that we will have and and probably add a few more years because we're taking the cow herd down again. So, you know, from a supply standpoint, we are gonna be in good shape. It's just the, the demand that we're uh, really, really worried about here and then corn prices. Just kind of switch gears a little bit here. Talk a little bit about milk prices. Uh, milk prices this year have done very, very well and are up to record levels, previous record back there in 2014 at about $25 a hundredweight, and now they're up to $27 a hundredweight. However, the bugaboo for milk prices, of course, is that uh, feed costs are significant higher too. So from a profitability standpoint, I mean, the higher prices are good news, but not, not making the huge amount that that might look at because both hay prices and the and of course, corn and soybean meal and so on prices are I do, but the milk prices are, are, are doing well. And we've got really strong exports and good domestic demand as well. Uh, dairy prices are high in Europe and high in Oceania and our competitors as well. So that's really helped the milk price situation out. And then when we look at dairy cow slaughter, opposite of beef cow slaughter, you see here, at least in the last several months now, dairy cow slaughter is running below the last couple of years because uh, trying to keep all the, the cows that we can. And kind of finish up on lambs here. We've had a kind of abrupt turnaround in the lamb market the last month or so. Uh, uh, from a supply standpoint, not a, re a problem in that, you know, we're down three to 5% on, on lamb production. But what's happened here, you know, since Easter, we kind of, you know, peaked out right there prior to Easter there, right at April and then have fallen off. But, you know, we've seen, uh, and some of this is kind of anecdotal, but we've been talking to restaurants and so on because of, of the gas prices and all those inflationary things that, that Brian mentioned uh, and, and, and the, and the, and the, people buying um, lower priced meat items because lamb is the highest price. We've seen a back off, particularly at the white table cloth restaurants on lamb and even at the retail level that really sparked during COVID when that's one of the meat that they could buy. And so because of that, here's just in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, uh, lamb uh, carcass weights have started to increase, indicating kind of a backup and, uh, on lambs, and, and packers are kind of backing off because uh, retail buying is somewhat backing off there. So we've moved be below uh, last year, 
And, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see here how that, you know, how the economy does. But I think probably, uh, and then on the feeder lambs corn, but we're uh, going to be still hopefully be, be above to those 20, uh, 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 16 to 20 average prices, but probably tough to get back up on the fed lambs uh, to where they were last year at those record high levels simply because uh, of the economy. So with that, uh, uh, I'm finished and uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks, Tim. Yeah. Uh, so Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy Bioproduct Specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, some quick uh, thoughts on the, the bioenergy situation. Uh, I have no idea what the outlook is. Things are getting pretty crazy, um, but to talk a little bit about what's going on. Uh, here's a chart of prices from South Dakota ethanol refineries in terms of what they're paying for corn, uh, what they're getting at the plant for ethanol or distillers grains uh, and leading to the next chart, which will be margins. And of course, right now what we're seeing is really high commodity prices in, in agriculture, energy uh, across the board. And uh, margins in general actually really good is cutting to the chase. Uh, but we have seen a you know dramatic run up in corn prices, which if we're in production agriculture, uh, that's good news. If you're a buyer of corn, not so much. Uh, and what we've seen also is a, uh, a pretty, pretty strong uh, ethanol price, uh, both at the wholesale level and then also at the retail level, uh, pulled in general by this recovery from COVID and, you know, this, this recovery of demand uh, and, and incomes and folks wanting to drive. So this is a, just a quick chart adjusting those prices from the previous uh, chart to the gallon equivalent basis. So the, the price of ethanol stays the same, uh, but we divide the corn price by 2.8, which is how many gallons we get from uh, a bushel of corn, uh, and then distillers grains price, adjusting that for the, the number of pounds that we get uh, from that same gallon. Uh, and if you kind of going down to that next line, we can see that simple crush. The simple crush is just the difference between our revenue from ethanol distillers grains less the price of corn. Uh, so it doesn't cover a, a, a number of important costs, but it gives you a good idea. Back of the thumb, at least in most years regarding profitability, and if we look at, at recent numbers, you know, you can see that, you know, beginning through last summer over the fall, you know, we've had, you know, near record margins, or at least for the, this last five or six years, very high margins. The one thing I don't take account for in this is the high price of natural gas. Uh, in the past, when, when natural gas has been two and a half, three dollars per MMBTU, it hasn't been a big deal. Uh, that's really not the case anymore. So that that additional cost really, you know, would be factored in for the actual profitability uh, of the refiners. And again, this is a, a signal to us about, you know, we're kind of keeping track of, you know, our corn ethanol refinery is going to continue to buy corn, continue to operate. And right now they're certainly in the money, uh, which is a good sign. And, you know, looking forward to the fall and the winter and in future years, you know, to, to keep that type of relationship there. Again, in, in many respects, you know, we're going to see what's going to happen to to gasoline demand uh, as as the economy responds to higher interest rates, to inflation, and you know, possible recession. Uh, just looking at uh, ethanol production uh, weekly, year over year, uh, the green line. I hope you can see it at least somewhat well. Is for this current year, and right now we're just under where we were in 2019. Uh, but we're actually quite a bit of ways underneath what our actual production capacity is nationwide. Uh, you know, we, we are seeing profits. It's just there's really not a tremendous amount of room uh, for additional product in the market and really working to, to build out some imports and, and additional markets for that globally. Of course, now with, with the, this, the status of the, the national economy, the global economy, uh, you know, some of those prospects are, are probably less bright than we might have thought, you know, a few months ago. Uh, something we're all familiar with, this is a uh, national average regular gasoline price. So this is E10. Uh, it's collected by AAA. Uh, for the first time ever, uh, we're over $5. And both in, in real and nominal amounts nationally, we're at record high prices. Uh, if you remember back a couple months ago, we're actually not at, at record high prices here in North Dakota. Our record high price adjusted for inflation is about $5.25. But that was really the result of uh, regional supply disruptions about a decade ago. 
that was really short lived for about a week. And so this is for the most part, you know, we're entering this this area if prices continue to rise rise somewhat uh, to be having record pr prices here in, in, in North Dakota as well. Uh, just looking a little bit about what's going on with relative prices for gasoline and ethanol. And so this is at the wholesale level, the rack level, that's the top chart, uh, dollars per gallon, which you can see the, the lighter green is gasoline price. It actually happens to be, it's Arbob, so the, the blend at New York Harbor. So kind of far away from where we're at. And then the, the blue line is actually uh, Chicago Argo prices. So the, the, the rack uh, in the Chicagoland metro and you can see there, there's quite a bit of a difference. Uh, some of that is being driven by high oil prices and, and you know, they oftentimes are, are priced closer to what's going on in Europe and we know what's going on in Europe uh, as opposed to what we see in, in much of the rest of the, the country. But again, in general, what we've seen is ethanol trading at uh, a, a bit of a discount on an energy equivalent basis. And again, revisiting that ethanol in this country for the almost uh, the entirety is used as a, as a fuel additive, not as a fuel, uh, again, because it, it increases octane at a price lower than, than alternatives uh, at almost all times. And again, too, we can kind of look at that price ratio in the bottom half of the chart, and you can see that we're, we're below one. And so that's ethanol price divided by gasoline price. And we're definitely in that zone where at the wholesale level, uh, ethanol is, is, uh, is about the same cost on an energy equivalent basis as gasoline or this gasoline uh, uh, blend. Looking at the actual level, so these are physical levels. Uh, the top is the, the absolute level. Uh, the, the orange line is finished motor gasoline, so that which is actually going from the, the, the refinery blender uh, into the uh, wholesale retail market. Uh, pretty much recovered, and, and you can kind of see the difference between that and the blue, which is the, the amount of ethanol that's actually just going into uh, blenders and refineries that it's been pretty constant. And if we divide the two, we can get an idea of what the, the relative blend is. This doesn't match up perfectly in terms of what consumers are actually buying. And there is a bit of a lag because we're talking about ethanol input into the blender refiners and motor gasoline that's supplied for the same week. But we actually saw for a bit of time before the beginning of the, the summer motor season where we actually had blends higher than 10% or that, that ratio is higher than 10%. Again, it doesn't mean that they're squeezing in uh, 11, you know, 11 percent for E10. You can't do that, but rather uh, E85 sales, E15 sales, uh, or just a bit of a lag uh, in that noise. Again, the idea, or the goal is within the industry is to, to to see that number increase. Of course, we also saw, you know, a little over a month ago, the administration allowed emergency sale of E15 to help alleviate uh, the price at the pump. Uh, another chart. Uh, this is the the current carbon price for uh, California LCFS credits. So low carbon fuel standard in California is, is really kind of the, the, the benchmark for uh, carbon prices. And, and this is something to look at when we think about uh, the, the profitability of renewable diesel and, and advanced biofuels and those sold both into California, but also other low carbon uh, fuel states uh, or provinces and countries and just see, seeing where things are at. And what we've actually seen, and one of the reasons I brought this up, is the price has actually fallen quite a bit, almost half from its high. And it's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, obviously, if you, if you want to, if you're long, low carbon fuels, you'd love to see a higher price. But really what we're seeing is a lot of additional, uh, very low carbon fuel coming on the market. And that's, you know, reduce the price. Uh, there was a bit of a blip at the end of May, uh, which, which I, I don't exact, which I don't have an explanation for. But if we look kind of longer term, to me, it's actually quite promising because it does recognize that, you know, folks are responding in the market. We're seeing additional uh, biofuel come online. We're seeing a lot of investment and movement towards even lower uh, carbon biofuels going forward. And I think this is really important because if we think about the expansion of low carbon fuels uh, across the country, you know, beyond California, which is about 10% of the transportation market. I think it's actually promising saying that there is some give that the, that the market can respond, that there is supply that we can provide uh, to, to, to meet the, these regulatory requirements. Uh, one of the quick things I just wanna talk about really, really briefly is uh, how to uh, maybe save a dollar at the pump. Uh, in terms of the, the relative pricing of different blends of ethanol. So E10 is regular, 
Uh, E15 or unleaded 88 uh, is can be used by you know vehicles made in the last 20 years, and then E85 is for flex fuel vehicles. But just kind of just wanted to share the rule of thumb of what you can do uh, to possibly save money at the pump. One of the points it has to be recognized too is that gasoline stations exist to make money. They're there to maximize pr profit. So you can't really look and say, gosh, you know, go back to those those rack numbers and say, well, the price of ethanol is so much less, I should be getting that. It's like, no, they're going to price it to that local market, or at least, you know, uh, principles of economics tells us that they should. Uh, so you can't necessarily expect those types of things. But moving down to the bottom half of the chart, uh, or the, 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 the slide here, we can see the relative energy uh, for these different types of fuels. And it's important to note too, that, that both E15 and E85, that there's a range. So it, it, these are not necessarily exact uh, to what you're going to be purchasing at the pump. It can actually vary quite a bit. There's a, you know, and they, they actually vary above and below these numbers, but this is kind of the, the, the midpoint of what we'd expect if we bought a 15% or 85% ethanol blend. Ethanol has less energy per, per unit of volume. It's just a characteristic of it. it. Doesn't mean it's a bad fuel, although some people like to pose it that way. But the thing that you want to do is you want to compare the relative energy basis if that's what you're doing to buy uh, when considering when you're when making that fuel purchase. E15 has uh, you know 1.7% less energy than E10. E85 has about 25% less energy. So just keeping those two ratios, and you might as well just say 2% and you know 25% when you go, you can actually calculate. Uh, what you should be expecting. So uh, just using an example, if, if gas does reach $5 uh, at, at your local station, I mean, besides the pain of that, you can do the quick math and say, well, you know, that 1.7% that or rounding up to 2% at about 490 uh, or less, E15 is selling at a discount on an energy equivalent basis. Uh, so that's great. And then for E85, it ends up being that that 25% or 24%. So it ends up being 376. Uh, and again, that those numbers are going to vary, but it, it's something that I think folks should be uh, thinking about. It's always fun to, to get a deal, to find a deal. Uh, and, and, and there's certainly some cases, I have some notes at the bottom uh, that that these these opportunities do exist. And they've existed, you know, off and on uh, for the last, you know, you know, few years for, for E15 and especially by market and also for, for E85. Uh, one of the most important things to, to note too is that engines are, you know, designed, tuned to, to run on certain fuels. And so even though you might have less energy uh, or a certain amount of energy, you might not get the mileage that you would get from that energy because it's not optimal to uh, how that engine's designed how it, and how it actually performs. You're not translating necessarily on that same basis, that change in BTU to miles down the road. Uh, but just so you know, uh, there is at least one gas station. I just checked this uh, before. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but if you want to go do your research, you can, uh, your field research. There's at least one gas station where E15 is selling at a discount to regular. And not only is it selling at a discount to regular, it's actually the lowest price fuel in town. Um, it's, it's trading it, or it's selling at uh, 437 a gallon. And that's less than you would see at either Costco or Sam's Club, which in the Fargo-Moorhead area is the lowest cost, uh, tip, um, almost always the lowest cost station. Uh, but that's kind of neat. And then also looking at E85, there's one station in Fargo. Uh, right now, there was one in Grand Forks earlier this week where E85 was sold at a discount on that energy basis. And I would say if you can take the time and find that station in Fargo, if the price that was posted is right, it's an absolute steal. Um, I, I, I would be surprised if it's a miss, uh, miss report because they usually keep track of that pretty well. Uh, but the price that is reported and it's a place that only takes cash uh, for that price, it might give you a little bit of a hint. Uh, it's, it's a substantial discount to that energy equivalent basis. Um, last thing I just wanna to touch on, I, I think that most of you have probably heard about this, uh, but just to let you know that we're fully expecting the possibility of rolling blackouts uh, in the Midwest this summer. Uh, they had a recent auction, MISO, which manages the, the grid in the Midwest and for much of North Dakota. Uh, they had an auction and they're essentially short of power during periods of peak demand uh, this summer. And then the way that is managed is that you would have rolling blackouts. And this is really caused 
by, uh, well, we can look at a specific state, we can look at the state of Illinois, they've retired a lot of nuclear and not uh, put themselves in a position to have uh, other energy sources available, uh, either intermittent or peaking facilities to help meet that uh, demand. And so I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, thank goodness it's not going to be this weekend with, with you know, record heat here uh, in the Dakotas for at least a day. Um, but sometime this summer, and it could be on a very, very hot day, that you'll see blackouts, uh, you know, here in North Dakota. Uh, so that's what I had for my presentation. I'd now be happy to open it up to everyone for any comments that they might have. I know no one's jumping at it. I do have one, one comment. I've seen it twice in the last week, one in a private conversation and yesterday at a, at a public conversation is that folks are not uh, factoring in inflation into some long-term price projections. And it, it can, it's distortionary. And that's one of the problems with inflation is it's really tough to, to, to prepare for the future. Uh, and, in, and in both cases, it was related to uh, forward or, or future natural gas prices where folks were saying, uh, look at it, it's going up. And that's because of this. It's like, no, if you look at that, it's actually staying flat in, in real terms. And so that's something that we're going to have to deal with. And again, if, if we all expect 3% uh, inflation, we can kind of build it in. But if it's eight and then four and then all over the place, it, it can make life a little bit more challenging. Yeah, there's a question for you, Dave. Yeah. So what are the prices of gasoline going to be the next 12 months? That's why I didn't call it an outlook because I really, <laughs> I don't know. You know, we're going we're gonna to see strong demand. And then to me, so much of it depends on the economy. Uh, you know, are we going to see a, a recession? Uh, how severe is that recession? How are folks impacted? You know, is that recession going to impact, let's let's call low income or, or low skilled folks? Are they going to lose their job and stop traveling it, or, you know, driving to and from work? There's a lot that can give. And again, right now, you know, we have a global energy crisis. Then we have our national, even regional markets for energy or for transportation fuel. And it, from my perspective, it's really tough to tell. I mean, one of the things that is nice, I didn't share this, the slides, but you know, we have seen the, 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 the domestic oil industry now respond as much as they can to these higher oil prices. So you know, we're seeing additional production. We're gonna have record production of, of oil in the United States this year, but really that forecast for future prices is I, I think the best way to say is it's gonna be really high through summer and probably high for the rest of the year, but it, it, it can give so quickly um, that, you know, that, that, that change in price, if people decide to stop dri driving or have to stop driving, you know, that, that excess supply and then the elasticity, uh, you know, you can, you can see rapid changes in, in what might happen uh, at the pump. Then there's a question for Frayne on Durham. Yeah. Um, so Durham prices this summer and fall. Um, I'll, I'll try and make this brief. I, I spoke with some industry people a couple of days ago and asked them about Durham acreage in North Dakota. Um, and I guess at North Dakota, Montana, and their expectation was we might actually see a slight drop in Durham seedings from the prospective plantings report. So we're always looking at that March uh, prospective plantings report as kind of the baseline um, because of some of the weather and shifting of acres and What's going to get planted? What not's going to? What's not going to get planted? There were some concerns that not all of the Durham acres, ex, intended Durham acres in North Dakota, will, will get seeded this year. So we'll have to watch that and look for that in the in the March, uh, or excuse me, in the June 30 report. Uh, the other thing that actually, I, in my opinion, will have a bigger impact will be what happens in Canada. The Canadians are are much larger producers by area as well as by volume. Um, most of that is kind of in. Uh, kind of a diagonal northwest, southeast, uh, through the middle of Saskatchewan. Uh, planting progress for Durham and Saskatchewan was, was pretty much on par, uh, but they were very dry coming into the season. They have been picking up some rain, so it looks like the early, uh, early indications are the crop is in pretty good shape, but it's very, very early. They have not had enough rains to do a bunch of recharge of soil moisture. So uh, I think the Durham crop in Canada will always be kind of on this bubble uh, of, of yield and yield, uh, yield drag potentially if it gets hot and dry. So I'm, I'm actually focused a lot more on what's happening in Saskatchewan and the growing region there uh, when it comes to rainfall and precipitation amounts. They did get seeded. 
it got seeded pretty much on time, but there's not a lot of soil moisture uh, to carry it through any kind of extended period of hot, dry weather. Um, one about central banks they expect to have uh, having to cut rates in 2024. Does that mean they're expecting a recession already? Um, well, one thing that the projected GDP growth rates have been uh, um, the projections for the remainder of this year and then 2023 have been revised downward already. Uh, the projection for 23 is already pretty low at 1.6 percent i think was the latest after this latest round and keeping in mind a recession is simply two consecutive quarters of negative growth so it's very possible I, i'm sure that recession is something that they're thinking about but they can be fairly mild um, like I said, uh, two, two consecutive quarters of negative 0.1 and negative 0.2, and then it bounces back and grows 2%. Well, that was a recession, and then the recession was, was over relatively shortly. I, I think it's certainly on their mind, and they're probably, uh, if, if you go back and look historically, when they have hiked rates up fairly sharply, they have come back later on and, and revised them back downwards. And the key to that will be, first of all, how high they push uh, rates in the next, I'd say, year or so, six months to a year. And then they may pair them back a percent or two uh, once they achieve their whatever their uh, objective is with, with inflation. One, one of the biggest challenges the Fed has is uh, the rate increases that they've already done really haven't trickled through the economy yet uh, as much. It, you know, their full effect hasn't been felt. As soon as they make a rate announcement, it affects the stock market. It affects uh, bond yield and stuff immediately. That stuff we get to see in real time basically happening. The other stuff, uh, the slowing of demand, which is what they're hoping to actually achieve, a slowing of demand, hence it, it, it slows the inflation rate down. And it's kind of like piggybacking on to what Dave said about gasoline. Because we're in an inflationary environment, uh, and, and things like food and energy are, are, are being impacted and they're such a big portion of the budget. You can have folks cutting spending just on that alone uh, and, then, and then you increase rates on top of it. And so you may not see like the mortgage rate or whatever go one for one or whatever is as high as the federal funds rate or the treasuries simply because people wind up cutting down the spending. And again, the interest rate is the... Uh, mechanism by which they manage supply and demand for loanable funds. But if inflation is high, people are paying on consumables, uh, higher prices, they can't buy durable goods, so they're not financing as much. So the supply of loanable funds stays strong, uh, stays fairly full, and uh, there's just not much demand for it. So you don't see that need to increase rates. And but going back to the recession, I would think that anybody, uh, there's a good chance that there will be when the, when the, when the, when the central bank increased rates remarkably in the eighties, it did force a recession. Um, but in some ways it's, I hate to use the word necessary, but it's kind of part of what it takes to curb inflation is to force a situation where demand wanes enough that even if I expect higher prices in the future, I can't go out and buy anything because demand, my, my demand is reduced. OK, so that's what they're trying to do. And part of inflation is inflationary expectations. If they hike rates high enough, people knowing this fact uh, revise their expectations for inflation in the future and thereby inflation actually reduces. Because in some ways, inflation can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And and then the mechanisms and the levers that they're pulling to try to curb it uh, changes expectations. It's it's a it's a kind of a complicated deal. And there's some, uh, you know, endogeneity in the whole thing where one variable if impacts the other variable, which then goes back and impacts the same variable before. Um, but I suppose that's an extremely long winded way to say that, yeah, they're probably uh, if, if, if they're thinking about this a recession is in the back of their mind. They, they certainly have to believe that it's very possible, especially with these GDP growth rates. It's not much to revise it down another point and a half and say, yeah, we're in a recession. But I think that probably has more to do with how long they think it will take these rate increases to curtail inflation than 
a expectations of some kind of prolonged or deep recession. But that's a very simple question with not a very simple answer. Brian. Well, it looks like there's no more questions. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and the panelists for, for presenting yet again. Uh, look forward to seeing you again in July on, on the 14th uh, after the next WASD report. And of course, stay cool this weekend. It, it's going to be a hot one. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.